Thank you, Ali. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about data engineering and management inside of the lake house. But before we get into that, why are we managing all of this data anyway? I've seen customers do all kinds of cool things with data, from predicting when turbines are going to fail, to trying to understand why customers are churning, to even crazier things like creating drugs that can cure cancer. But before you can do any of those cool things, there's a lot of complexity in taking the data from its sources and bringing it to these places where you're going to do these types of analytics. Let's walk through what some of those different steps are. First, you need to ingest the data. So you need to read these streaming and batch sources, often messy, using a variety of tools, and then dump it into your data lake. Once it's in the data lake, though, we're not done. Often that data is messy, and you need to do transformation and cleansing in order to get it ready for these analytics. So there's tools like AWS Glue or Synapse, which allow you to kind of uh, clean things up and transform the data until it's ready for consumption. And you can see in this picture, we've cobbled a bunch of them together. And so let's say we get all of those transformations right. Well, the next challenge is these pipelines can actually be very expensive and often brittle. And so you need to create a whole separate section for monitoring and tuning them. So you'll have tools like CloudWatch or Datadog or Nagios that are helping you understand what the utilization of your cluster is, uh, you know, what, what things are failing, how much money you're spending on different pipelines. And so we'll add all of that complexity into our pipeline as well. That brings us to the next challenge. These things need to run on a schedule regularly. And it's more than just running at a schedule. You often need to understand dependencies. One data set cannot be updated until its, its parent data sets are updated. And so you'll see a variety of schedulers, like Uzi or Airflow, or even things like Azure Data Factory brought in to kind of coordinate and orchestrate all of these different systems. Let's say you, you complete all of that. Now I've got these clean data assets, but who has access to them? This brings in governance and sharing. I want to make sure the right people have access to it. I want to make sure that access is audited. And I also want to make sure that the wrong people don't have access to it. So some people will bring in you know, kind of classic cloud data warehouses to do this. But oftentimes, that's not enough, because some things live outside of the data warehouse. So you'll bring in kind of overarching tools like Immuta or Okera. And that's just another piece of complexity in our system. And so what you can see here is this seemingly simple task of ingesting some data and doing analytics on it has become quite complicated. And the real problem with this is all of this tooling and this complexity is distracting from our original goal, which is gaining insights and doing cool things like machine learning. So instead, I want to spend the rest of this talk talking about what data management looks like inside of the lake house. And let's start back again at the beginning with ingest, talking about this really cool tool called Autoloader. I've seen many businesses have tons of data available inside of their, their data lake, but often it just starts out as a whole bunch of files. Someone upstream from you is dumping CSV or JSON or Excel files into a bucket, and it's your job to extract it. That can be quite difficult, because often this data can become incredibly huge. And so in order to ingest it efficiently, you need to make sure you do it incrementally. Each time you load new data, you want to make sure you're only reading the data that's arrived since the last time you did processing. You don't want to reprocess the same data over and over again. And what Autoloader does is it does this automatically. You point it at a bucket in any cloud storage system, from Google to Azure to Amazon, and we will automatically turn that into an exactly one stream of data. And we automatically handle a lot of the scalability problems. We will record what has already been ingested so that we don't ingest it twice. And we'll even go so far as to integrate with cloud-specific APIs so that rather than poll for new data, we'll set up queues and other systems that we actually get new data actively pushed to us. And this can allow you to ingest even tens of millions of files very efficiently. And ingestion isn't the end of it. You also need to make sure that you understand the schema of these files. And that's often changing over time. So Autoloader has powerful schema inference, where it can understand the schema of any given file. It can take those all together to come up with a grand unified schema across data sources. And it can even handle evolution as those change. And that evolution is tunable. You can decide whether you want new columns to just automatically get added to your data lake, or if you want to raise alarms and have engineers come in when things are shifting out from underneath you. And Autoloader is pretty great, but not all data is available as files. And that's where Databricks Partner Connect comes in. It's a fast, easy, and self-service way to get data from that long tail of data sources that are very important to your business. And that's kind of one of the key things about the Lakehouse architecture is it's about all of the data. It's about breaking down those silos so that you can join and augment data from different sources. So along with our partners, Fivetran and Rivery, 
You can, just with a couple of clicks inside of the Databricks UI, import spreadsheets or sales data from Salesforce, data from traditional relational databases, or even marketing data from social networks. So now that we've got the data in our data lake, what do we do with it next? It turns out it's rarely ready for consumption, and so now we're on to the transforming and cleansing and monitoring and tuning of those pipelines. And that's why I'm excited to talk about Delta Live Tables. Delta Live Tables allows you to declaratively build these data pipelines with your business logic. But this is not your average SQL query. You're not just firing and forgetting it. Instead, Delta Live Tables understands the dependencies between these SQL queries and automatically updates them as new data arrives at the source. It understands this data flow graph, and new data will kind of magically flow through these dependencies. And the reason I think this is really cool is it kind of changes the paradigm for how you're going to work with data. In the past, it was usually a SQL analyst or a data scientist would come up with a notebook that would do some cool analysis. But if you wanted to turn that into a production report that was produced every day with an SLA, you'd have to hand it off to a different team. And that team would have to rewrite this from scratch in Java or Scala, often hopefully not changing it too much. With Delta Live Tables, instead, everybody who knows SQL is a data engineer. You can take that SQL and directly turn it into a production pipeline. It's more than just transformations, though, because you know, anyone can write a SQL query wrong, or even if you get your SQL query right, the data underneath you might change. And that's why quality is built into Delta Live Tables. We have this cool technique called expectations, where you declaratively state what you expect about the data. This is similar to a constraint in a traditional relational database, but it's actually quite a bit more powerful. In the big data world, if you abort every time you see something unexpected, you won't get a lot done. And that's why expectations have tunable severity. So you can say when one of your expectations is violated, if it's a very critical expectation and you're uh, reporting it to a, a regulatory agency, you can still abort the pipeline and have an engineer come and look in. But earlier in your pipeline, often you just want to count how many records are bad and set alerts at various thresholds, or drop that data, but still have thresholds to make sure you're not dropping too much data. And in the future, we plan to expand this so that you can even do powerful things like quarantine the data come back, fix your transformations, and then transactionally re-ingest it into the system. And this isn't just a one and done snapshot of the quality of your, your data lake. We actually capture all of this quality information over time so you can understand trends in, in your data lake. And another big part of this is production. So when you're running a pipeline, there's going to be transient failures. There's going to be problems. And Delta Live Tables takes care of this automatically. All of the statistics uh, about operations, about utilization, about failures are automatically captured in that same log that I was just talking about. And retries are automatically managed. And you have this nice graphical interface to understand how processing is going and where there are any problems, if there are any. And that brings us to our improved orchestration in jobs. The Databricks job scheduler previously could schedule just a single task. But with this new ability, you can now orchestrate DAGs of tasks using either the UI or the API. And this orchestration is fully integrated in the Databricks platform. So you can set ACLs, inspect results, and get direct access to the cluster logs for debugging. This orchestration works the same way across clouds. And so you can use it wherever the data is or wherever you can get the best price on computing. And this is based on the Databricks job scheduler. So it's there for your most critical jobs. And it's not just about Databricks. There's a wide ecosystem of things that work with the, with the, the Databricks job scheduler. We're really excited about this preview for Airflow. So you can actually bring your Airflow DAGs to Databricks and run them on our scheduler on fully managed infrastructure. This is integrated with our platform. So it's built into the UI. And you can set ACLs in the same way you do on other resources within the Databricks workspace. And we don't just stop at Airflow. We also just added a, another preview for a task type where you can run dbt jobs. dbt is the data build tool, which allows people to take SQL queries and turn them into tables. And you can also use this inside of the Databricks job, job scheduler. So just to summarize, the, the job scheduler allows you to schedule and orchestrate DAGs of arbitrary task types across any platform where you're working with data. And next, now that we've produced these data assets and they're being regularly updated, we need to make sure that we govern the results. And this is where Unity Catalog comes in. Unity Catalog gives you fine-grained governance. It turns out it's very difficult to do governance in a traditional data lake because files and directories are just not a good abstraction for it. If I have a particular data set that I want to share with somebody, but there's one column that contains PII that they shouldn't see, in a traditional data lake, you'll have to make an entire copy of it. And then you'll have to manage those copies in all time. But we've known how to solve this problem for years with standard ANSI SQL. 
With Unity Catalog, you can now use standard SQL to grant and revoke access to individual tables and views inside of your data lake. The really cool part about this is it actually manages all of the cloud permissions for you. Unity Catalog mints temporary access credentials for the specific cluster for the specific data that's going to be accessed. And you might say, well, what happens when I have tens of thousands of data assets and tens of thousands of people? Setting all of these permissions must be pretty difficult. And that's why Unity Catalog takes it a step further and adds attribute-based access control. Rather than directly granting access to individual users, instead, you can specify the attributes of the data. For example, this table has PII. And then I can make sure that the system restricts data with PII to only a carefully curated set of users. And again, this is all done kind of automatically using standard SQL interfaces. But it's not only about typing SQL into a command line. There's also a pretty cool Unity Catalog UI that allows people to visually understand the lineage and audit trails of data. They can collaborate with their coworkers to talk about the quality and discover data sets that will be useful to them. And data stewards can set or review permissions along with these audit logs and understanding of lineage. And finally, now that we've got all these great data sets, I don't just want to keep them inside of my company. They could be incredibly valuable to my customers or to my partners. And this is where Delta Sharing comes in. Delta Sharing is the first open standard for sharing massive data sets. This is quite a bit different from sharing systems in other, uh, other uh, vendors because it is truly open. You can do Delta Sharing without involving Databricks at all. It's an open protocol. And basically, the way it works is you can take any one of these connectors, Pandas, Spark, Tableau, Power BI, along with a whole bunch of others, and they can connect to a Delta Sharing server. And that can be either the Unity catalog or our fully open source reference implementation. What happens is that catalog, that sharing server, will just mint temporary credentials that allow that connector direct access to the data. So the data doesn't even need to flow through the system. The processing happens directly on the data by the engine of your choice. And that's pretty unique and powerful, because it allows you to share data sets not only once, but keep those data sets live efficiently. So just to summarize, the lake house dramatically advances data management and data engineering. You can use Delta Live Tables to turn anybody who knows SQL into a full-fledged ETL engineer. Unity Catalog makes it easy to govern and audit the assets that are produced by those data pipelines. And Delta Sharing makes it possible to take those cool data assets and share them with your customers and partners outside of your organization. So you might be thinking to yourself that that sounds a little bit too good to be true, which is why I'd like to spend a little bit of time building an end-to-end -end production ETL pipeline just by writing a few lines of SQL. In this example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read some raw sensor data that's stored in JSON out in S3 and do some basic ETL as well as quality control on it. Let's start by ingesting that raw data, which is simple as writing a, a create table statement. So I'll just do create incremental live table. It's important this is incremental because we don't want to reprocess all of that JSON data every single time. We'll call it raw data and we'll write a SQL query that defines the ingestion. So we'll just do select star from, and we'll use the autoloader source to, to parse and infer the schema of those JSON files. The data is stored at slash data slash sensors, and it's stored in JSON. Now that we've got the data ingested, let's do some basic ETL on it. So I'll do create table, create live table, and we'll call this one readings. And we'll just write another select statement here that does some basic processing on each of the different columns. So we'll use the to timestamp function to parse a timestamp. We'll call this timestamp. And we'll also go ahead and cast the sensor reading itself to a number type as reading. And we'll also remember which sensor this information is coming from. And we'll do from live-raw data. This live keyword is actually part of the magic. That's a virtual database that will automatically be substituted at runtime with the correct database for the pipeline that's running. This gives us an extra layer of indirection so that our staging version and our production version both run in different sandboxes on the same set of code. That allows us to make sure that things that we're testing and staging don't break the production version, which our customers are depending on. So this looks pretty good, but there's a couple of other things I need to do as a good data engineer. First of all, I need to make sure that I document what I've done so that other people who are doing data discovery understand what these tables are and where they're coming from. So I had a comment to this one that says, 
raw sensor data from JSON. And we'll go ahead here and say comment sensor data with some basic ETL. And of course, quality is also really important. So I'm gonna add some expectations to this table as well. I'm gonna start with the timestamp because timestamp parsing can be pretty difficult. So I'll say constraint valid timestamp. And we expect that the timestamp is not null. So any null timestamps will get recorded as bad data and the system will let us know about that. So this looks pretty good. Let's jump over to the pipelines details page where we can run it. So I'll go ahead and click start here. And you can see we've got all of the operational information about the pipeline right here. It's currently initializing and setting up all of those different tables that we've created. After it's parsed and understood the SQL queries, it shows this data flow graph. So you can see it's gonna read the raw data and then that will flow into readings. One of the really cool things about Delta Live tables though is all of this information is not only available in the UI, it's also available in what we call the event log. The event log is available here, but is also a Delta table stored in your account that you can use the full power of SQL to query. This lets you look kind of across uh, the pipeline, also do longitudinal analysis of how things are changing over time, if you can see if things are taking longer or going faster. And pretty cool. So that now that that's complete, we can see it looks like this ran. And it took, you know, 25 seconds to do this JSON. But here comes the really cool part. If I run this again, Delta Live Tables has automatically incrementalized this computation. So hopefully the second time will be significantly faster. And you can see this time it realized there's no new data and it finished almost immediately. If I click on one of these tables, we can see exactly what the, the data quality is like. And it looks like we got all that timestamp parsing right. So now I'm complete. So there it is, a complete end-to-end -end production pipeline with high quality in just a few lines of SQL. So now that you've seen how we create data assets, the next talks uh, by Reynolds will talk about how you can do analytics on those data sets, and then Clemens will expand that by talking about machine learning. But if you want to learn more about data engineering, I encourage you to check out our white papers, which are available on our website, our case studies about customers who have been successful with this lake house pattern, and check out the breakout session later today on data engineering. Thank you very much.